Welcome to those on the live stream and welcome to the live people as well. It's good to have you here, very alive this morning. The, the cold is picking us up, isn't it? We had a great fog out of out at our place this morning, so we know the season's changing. Uh, it's good to see you here. We've got a, a big morning this morning, uh, moving on from our service uh, to the annual meeting and then to lunch. Uh, so there's lots happening. We read this in Revelation 15. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we can uh, gather here this morning. We uh, know that your spirit is amongst us and we thank you that as we meet together in the name of Jesus to worship you through him, we ask, Father, that you would just um, delight us in hearing your word, uh, transform us, uh, uh, mould us into a people that are pleasing to you. Uh, we thank you for all that's going to happen this morning and we commit this time to you in your son's name. Amen. Well, we'll stand and sing Jesus, thank you. We, we haven't got any musos today. Evidently, uh, they're not being paid enough and the hours are too long. <laughs> so, so, so we'll... Now, it's Jesus, thank you, so we'll stand and sing. Uh, there might be one or two uh, frilly bits in it, so we'll see how we go. Anyway, it's a, great, it's a great song and we'll stand together and sing.
wonderful God, we thank you that you fill our hearts with your hope and our lives with a sense of expectation, that you heal our wounds and wipe away our tears, that you excite us with your grace and overwhelm us with your mercy, that in Christ's life, death and resurrection you have demonstrated your victory over death and despair and given us the assurance that nothing but nothing can bring an end to your loving kindness toward us or separate us from your love. Thank you that you bring us through every time of pain, brokenness and anxiety, that we can speak to others of your love in total confidence of its reality and its power to make all things new. Thank you for the peace, hope, joy and courage which, with which you have filled our lives and for the uh, gratitude with which you have flooded our hearts. We thank you and we praise you and we worship you, for you alone are worthy. We ask that by the Holy Spirit, you will take all that we have brought, our songs, our hymns, our words, our, and our prayers, and transform them through his wonderful, powerful presence into joyful celebration that is worthy of the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. In the name of Christ the Lord, we pray. Well, Mr. Amen. Okay. Uh, you may not have heard, I certainly didn't, that on Saturday the 5th of April, a cyclone struck uh, Timor-Lest. Were you aware that that happened? Um, one of Australia's closest neighbours, we don't hear too much about them usually, and this resulted in major flooding and landslides and all the rest of the property damage and everything else that comes with it. Uh, the Presbyterian Church of Australia has a, a strong association with the Presbyterian Church in Timor-Lest and as a result of that, um, the PCA, Presbyterian Church of Australia, right, uh, would like to um, help that church over in Timor. Uh, so Peter Barnes, who's the Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church, wrote this, on the 5th of April 2021, cyclone, um, a cyclone struck Timor-Lest and caused extensive damage to our northern neighbours, including members of one of our partner churches, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Timor-Lest. The, the main church building survived, but something like 52 church households were deeply affected by the floods. There was quite a number of deaths in the wider community. To rebuild after such devastation takes determination and a strong morale. We certainly know about that in Australia, don't we? And the prayers and support of Australian Presbyterians will be much appreciated by our partner church. There are, as one would expect, food shortages and threatening medical issues at such a time. As the great apostle of grace tells us in the context of his uh, gathering the collection for those suffering from famine in Judea, God loves a cheerful giver. And that's with warm regards in Christ, Peter Barnes. Have a listen to this short video. Banjir yang begitu besar dari mulai dari minggu kemarin, minggu kemarin yang membuat uh, banyak orang kehilangan uh, barang, rumah, uh, dan ada juga yang uh, meninggal dunia karena uh, erosi dan banyak hal lagi yang terjadi. Tapi uh, bersyukur buat teman-teman karena mau tahu situasi kami di Timor Leste mengenai apa yang sedang terjadi di sini mungkin uh, sudah melihat di media online yang beredar di seluruh dunia dan banyak teman-teman uh, dari luar yang uh, support uh, membantu kami dalam doa kami bersyukur uh, untuk semuanya dan saat ini kami terus melakukan hal-hal yang perlu untuk membantu masyarakat di Dili dan sekitarnya dan gereja-gereja kami di Timor Leste. <SILENCIO> 
today is Friday, five days after the rain. As far as we can receive information, we only know about Delhi. The districts, especially the, the, the villages that are far from Delhi, they have no electricity and very little uh, contact with us. We have heard of more than 10 houses in Aileo and a few other places in the districts that have, the, have lost their houses and their belongings. And we don't know yet uh, how bad is the situation in some of the districts. So this is one of the challenges that we have uh, ahead of us. So please pray for us, uh, pray, pray for wisdom and opportunities to better serve these people and attend their needs. And pray for our safety, our safety. We need water and food and good health, especially in times of the, uh, the COVID-19 is growing in cases here in Delhi. Thank you very much for your prayers, for your support, for your uh, friendship and relationship with the church here in Timor Leste. May God bless you. and I pray for them right now while it's fresh on our minds. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Timor-Lest who have uh, undergone this uh, devastating major flooding and landslides and property damage um, due to this cyclone, and we indeed pray for the whole country. We remember uh, our sister churches uh, over there who are recovering and um, they're struggling to maintain their services with property damage and, uh, and pastoral support to so many people uh, who have been hurt. Father, we pray that you would uh, help the church rebuild. Uh, we pray for those thousands of lives that have been affected. And we pray that the church can maintain a clear gospel witness uh, as it moves into the future. Uh, we Pray, Father, that uh, the Presbyterian Church in Australia collectively uh, may be able to support uh, the church with our gifts and, um, and as we receive reports of more need, we ask that we would uh, respond in a loving and caring way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I'll do is I'll put in Church Matters um, the details if, you, if you'd like to make a contribution or... Alternatively, I guess you could just get an envelope and mark it and put it uh, in the offering plate up the back and Narelle will see that marked on and we can forward any money you'd like to give there too. Well, let's uh, remain seated as we uh, listen to Emu Music sing the song Undivided.
great song and it fits into what Dale's going to be sharing with us later. You know, I always need encouraging to share my faith because I never find it easy to do and, uh, and anything uh, or anyone that encourages me to do that, um, I, I welcome. Um, you know, we look at the world outside us and, you know, we think that people will think us to be foolish or silly or uh, old-fashioned, you know, if we... Um, begin to talk to them about Jesus. So I always need reminding and encouraging. And I was encouraged during the week uh, to read the results of a um, McCrindle survey. I don't know whether you know of McCrindle survey. Uh, McCrindle is a, um, uh, is a social researcher from the Uni of New South Wales who's a Christian fellow. And uh, he was commissioned by the Centre for Public Christianity right, to do a survey about people's views uh, on, on Christian things. And the results suggest as a nation, uh, we're told, that we might not be as sceptical as we think we are, uh, which is interesting, isn't it? So um, just to go straight to the um, rub of it, a big headline is that, that there remains an opetus in our community to a non-material reality. A majority of Australians, according to this research and sampling, uh, and a majority of Australians remain very open to the possibility of miracles, uh, of God, of a higher purpose to life and life after death. Uh, most Australians are open to the idea, the possibility of, of a soul. Right? So people are perhaps a little more in tune with non-material things than perhaps we give them granted for. Uh, a second headline is that there's a good group of people who say that they're unsure or don't know what to think about Christian things. So. Uh, when the specific question uh, was asked of what people believe about Jesus' resurrection, over 28% of people said that they just don't know, right? They just don't know what to think. And 43% were open to the possibility of the resurrection being true. Right? And that fills me with a lot of confidence, right, when it comes to sharing my faith, that, you know, I won't have to share my faith uh, uh, amongst too many people to come along and meet somebody who's interested in, in spiritual things and is happy to think uh, in those terms. Uh, a final headline relates to the way Christianity is perceived in Australia in various areas of life. So what do you think are the parts of, the, of our community, right, that think highly or more favourably about Christianity? Where, where do you think that might come from in, in our society? Any thoughts? It's the um, a charity sector, right? Seventy uh, percent uh, positivity there, and education, right? Fifty-seven percent positivity. Um, <laughs> let's look at the other side of the coin. Who is it, or what sectors in our culture do you think have m the most negative views of the gospel and Christian things? Where, where, do, where do they come from? Do you think in our society? Yeah, but um, people as a group, you know, what, what sort of group of people? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, well done. The media, uh, the media were 37% uh, negativity and the other area is politics. Yeah, 39% uh, negativity. Right. So here's the conclusion. Uh, McCrindle says Australia might be steadily disaffiliating from r religious institutions he says it as a side comment, but I think that's a big comment, right? He's saying that Australia might be st steadily disaffiliating from religious institutions, right? So something in, the, in religious institutions needs to change, right, doesn't it? And, and hence one of the reasons why we've done all this around us, right? It's part of a small thing, it's part of a bigger picture. So although... Uh, Australians might be steadily disaffiliating from religious institutions. That does not mean all Australians are closed to the possibility of a non-material reality. One more thing. What, what age groups do you think, uh, what, what age group, age bracket, do you think is open, uh, more open to spiritual beliefs? What, what age bracket do you think that roughly might be in? Yeah, under 30s. Any other thoughts? 
that, that's right, David. Um, we found stronger openness to spiritual beliefs amongst 18 to 26-year-olds. Isn't that interesting? But the most sceptical cohort was 57 to 75-year-olds. Okay. So it, it's good to remember that amongst all the figures and the research and all that, right, God's working his purposes out, right? In the end, he's not foiled by age groups or social distinctions. But it's good for us as we think about how we might share the gospel. And I was certainly encouraged, right, that, um, you know, to keep um, doing that. Um, I find it hard. I, I gather I'm not the only person in the room who feels that way. So let's encourage each other, right, to share our faith and, and to be out there and to see God's kingdom grow. Well, David's going to come and pray for us now. Prayer of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come seeking your blessing on our church today. As we know, every day you are there to those who call upon you with their needs. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, whose love is everlasting to all believers. In the beginning, your spirit brooded over the chaos and the void. In the beginning, your word called forth order, beauty and life. And it was good. Throughout the ages, you have come when your people called out in distress. You have come when your people ignored your will and hurt one another. You have come for your people again and again through history, through prophecy, through the cross. You have come, as you know, our every weakness. You have come because you know our hearts. You have come because you know us so well that, are you, that you are ready for your believers to be lifted from the dangers of this earthly life. We ask you first to cleanse our hearts and show us if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives so that our prayers for others will not be hindered. We thank you that through your name we can come boldly before you and pray with confidence according to your will and know that you hear our prayers. Lord of all being, light of the world, we thank you for, we think of our Queen and Royal Family at this time and ask that in the quiet time she will look to you for comfort and support. Strengthen in her love for Christ Jesus, your Saviour, your son, our saviour. We lift up those in our neighbourhood, in our city and in our churches. Begin with those who follow you. Help them influence others for good. Let them be the salt and light, pointing others to you, Lord. Deepen their love for you and for the people around them. Guard them from hypocrisy and from giving in to temptation that could cause the harm of Christ. Raise up leaders who will serve you faithfully at all cost. Turn the hearts of fathers towards their children and families towards you. Help them to exemplify your values and make them bold in their faith. Strengthen our families and those closest to us, Lord. We are encouraged by the love and support you give to those who seek your blessing. We mention now Chris Berry, Margaret Badger's daughter Joan and Sue Balfe's sister Marge as they face daily battle with ongoing cancer treatment. Your comfort will be a great support for them and they will find strength in their faith to fight these battles trusting in you. We ask you to be with Dulcie Berry as she recovers from surgery. We have others in our church family that have needs of your tender care as we mention them quietly in our minds. We pray for the children's work that is being done within our church by the believers led by Olivia 
and trust that this work will be rewarding for you, showing others opportunity of a new way of life with Christ through music. Our world is in turmoil as we see guns, knives, greed and selfishness out of control. Bring awareness of Christ to these people through our action of concern so that the name of Jesus will be sought to curb the violence and so bring people together with purpose, knowing you, knowing you seeking forgiveness and let your Holy Spirit work in them to give purpose and direction to life as we find in the scriptures. May our love for you help us to love and forgive others and make a difference in your world. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name, our Redeemer, Rescuer and Liberator. Good morning, everyone. Amen. Um, the first reading today is Psalm 133 on page 615. And I'm really glad it's been, the message is on it today because it's full of picture language that's probably strange to our ears. So looking forward to that. Psalm 133, and it's only three verses. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Second reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, first 16 verses, and that's on page 1158 if you want to follow. Unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended <coughs> is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants <clears throat> tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. <clears throat> Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Morning again. This is our um, second psalm that um, I've chosen to work on. I took the advice of someone last week who said, look, um, just find a really short one. That way, <laughs> that way you won't have to say so much. <laughs> so, so Psalm 133, but still... This is God's word and I still find it hard to say little about <laughs> God's word. How about we pray? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that your word is alive and that it speaks to our very hearts, divides those motivations that are in there. 
and calls us to serve you single-mindedly. We pray for understanding today, and you'd help me explain this uh, carefully and truthfully. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, we are all aware, I think, of um, Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper. There's uh, the picture there. I've never really liked it. I'm, I'm not sure why. It's just something about the faces and what they're all doing. But anyway, it could be, um, you know, art is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? So, um, it, the interesting thing about it is when you look at it, the sitting Jesus and his disciples are all together there. And who's amongst them? There's, tw there's 12 there and we know that Judas is there amongst them. We're not sure which one Judas is. But um, Judas spent three years being trained by Jesus, uh, going everywhere with him. He got to sit and eat regularly with him. And, uh, well, we're assuming that, you know, for all intents and purposes, he was one of them. They didn't catch on that he was a traitor until very late, very at the end. And in the painting, it appears that Jesus and the disciples were unified. Together, they worked on various ministry projects and, uh, and ate and travelled for three years. To everyone who saw them, they were unified. They were together. They were part of the team. Nevertheless, we know their hearts were not unified. Judas was on his own mission for his own glory. And scripture records that before betraying Jesus, Judas opened himself to be possessed by Satan. It pains me to think, when I look at that picture, how much um, betrayal is going on in the group. Did they feel betrayed? Um, did they feel lied to? I wonder about how they felt at the end. We're not really told. Did they feel used? Did they feel foolish? Because they entrusted themselves to someone who was secretly the enemy. Whatever they felt. It makes us think about the cost that must be paid when the church divides. Not every lack of unity rises to that level, of course, where there's a level of betrayal like that. But every one, every division in the church, in the body of Christ, does cost. It has an enormous cost. It costs the church and it costs the leaders of the church time and energy and emotional stress. I think if you ask pastors, the greatest stressor in their lives is church disunity. From the very beginning, God's answer to the international blight of sin, worldwide, humankind, blight of sin, was to create a new community. And he started that through Abraham. It would be through a small nation called Israel, and that nation would be a pattern of blessing and, and a vehicle for redemption to the whole world. The nation was to be holy to the Lord. That was uh, something that was often written on the foreheads of the sanctified priests or those people working in the tabernacle. This new community was to embody righteousness, peace, justice and love that would cause the nations to envy them. Wow, look at Israel and the way they do their life together. We want to be like that. God's plan was that the nations uh, see Israel and be attracted to him. Well, we know the story, don't we? It didn't play out the way that it was intended there. Israel failed. But in God's economy, Israel's failure didn't mean the end of God's plan because God is all too good at overturning uh, our weaknesses and doing his thing through us. Through Jesus, his only son, a new community of people would be formed who would reflect the very mind of God toward the world. This radical new community would be made up of individuals like you and me who are changed from the inside out and who would identify with Jesus by faith. So, here we are, God's radical new community. Are you feeling it? You should be. It's a privileged position to be in. 
God's called you to be a part of this. There are many communities throughout the world. You know, you hear about them on the media every week or every time the news is on. Somewhere, somewhere, someplace, there's a group saying something. But this community is to be unique. It's to be one with um, something that you can't find in any other gathering. And one of those qualities is the subject of Psalm 133, a unity that surpasses, I guess, human um, ability. Because you know what we're like. <laughs> we're all biased toward ourselves, aren't we? So in, David says, it's something in Psalm 133, it's something that is both good and pleasing. That's the word there, it says, verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and let's remember, it's sisters, brothers and sisters, living together in unity. How good. Not everything that's good is pleasant. But, and not, likewise, not everything that's pleasant is good. But here you've got the two together. They're both, it's good and pleasant. Well, what is it? How does it happen? So there's a synopsis that I've sort of worked out. And if you cut out the middle verse and just put the first and the third, well, the last half of the verse three together, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live, in, live together in unity for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. That's a good summary of it. So I can sit down now. You understand, don't you? <laughs> no. I like what Sue said. The um, illustration carries all the weight. And so we'll have to look to see. We'll see if we can understand these illustrations. Um, so what does the unity that the Bible's talking about look like? So in, uh, in this particular psalm, there are two pictures, the anointing of Aaron and the Jew of Hermon on Mount Zion. The, with Aaron's um, anointing, it's, uh, it's clear that it's on Aaron's beard that the oil's running down. If we take our cue from that, then this is a special anointing. Um, it tells us something very important. This oil is made... Is, is made specifically for Aaron. In Exodus chapter 30, you can read about how it's put together out of very expensive um, spices and perfumes. I think uh, together there's myrrh, cinnamon, cane, cassia and olive oil. And the purpose of this oil is to set apart uh, um, Aaron for his job. He is to be sanctified. This makes Aaron holy to the Lord. Putting this oil on, brings a holiness that, he, that makes him acceptable before God to do his work. Because Aaron's there to represent God before the people and the people before God. So it was a sign, this oil, flowing on Aaron down to his collar of the grace of God setting him apart, making him holy, cleansing. It was a very important thing. It wasn't to be used for any other purpose. There are other anointings and... Uh, and we remember how David was anointed by Samuel for his kingship. But this oil was specifically for this job. And we remember what Peter says in the New Testament. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I'm sure what Peter's talking about there is the priesthood of all believers. That means, well, in a way, we're all like Aaron. We're set apart by faith in Jesus, made holy, cleansed, prepared for our role before the world, that is to ex, uh, tell about Jesus. And so we have this precious oil that sets, him up, sets Aaron apart. It sets us apart. This anointing that we have from God through the Holy Spirit makes us equipped to be his people, to be a very special people. So there's that first point. We are very special it's a very special congregation. It's a very special gathering. It's a very unique gathering. And secondly, the oil runs down, running down and down. There's the repetition again. Remember what we said about repetition. It's for emphasis. And there's a flow from top to bottom going on here. As Aaron was anointed, it would flow down his face, over his beard, onto his collar and his robes. It was... Um, probably the most uncomfortable thing, but I don't know about, I don't know whether 
you like having oil all over you. I've not really experienced it very much, but it's, it doesn't make me feel good. But maybe, you know, lotions and perhaps we should put some Nivea at the door for people who come in and maybe that would work. I don't know. Would you like that? <laughs> it would help you. I don't know. But the anointing of Aaron was so that he could be a blessing to others. There's a flow going on. And as the oil flowed all the way down, suggested the flow of blessing from Owen to other, outward to others, from God himself. This was a gift from God. Um, and imagine, this is a very beautiful perfume, perfumed oil. So you'd be carrying this perfume with you everywhere you went, this ar lovely aroma. So the person who uh, is uh, you know, at one with God, a congregation that is unified with God, is going to be a wonderful aroma to the world out there, to everyone who comes in contact with. It's going to be a great blessing. It's very attractive to people. It's something that churches need but don't have a lot of, to be honest. How fragrant, how soothing, how restorative is it to broken and fallen people when they can come to a community which accepts, welcomes, gets around them, rejoices with them, mourns with them, and basically says, we love you. Isn't that a wonderful thing? People so need that today. So the, uh, the, o, the, the Aaron's oil, it flows down, it's down, and we too have that sort of characteristic that, that we're given from God to share with others. It's, a, it's outward. It's not for us alone. It's not a selfish thing. We're to give it, and the gospel is like that. There's a third thing that I think is uh, not specifically mentioned in this particular uh, anointing, but it is more of a general anointing that goes on, and in Oriental homes, it, I've read about this and it says that uh, it's, it's a welcoming thing. So you go to a home in the Orient, in the Middle East, and you'll be offered some oil for anointing. And to apply the oil to the forehead of the visitor is to show great respect and confer a blessing. It confers warmth and welcome. Um, perhaps in the hot Middle Eastern countries, it perhaps is a moisturiser as well for dry skin. You know, you've been out in the wind all day, that part of your face is very hot and dry. But it's also a great perfume. You know, a body odour, I believe, is a problem in some of those areas. Captain Wilson, in his book, in Oriental Customs, which was written in the 1800s, says, I once had this ceremony performed on me in the house of a great and rich Indian in the presence of a large company. The gentleman of the house poured upon my hands and my arms a delightful odoriferous perfume. He put a golden cup into my hands and poured wine into it until it overflowed, ensuring me at the same time that it was a great pleasure for him to receive me and that I should find a rich supply of all my needs in his house. That's a lovely welcoming thing to do, isn't it? It reminds me of something that David says in Psalm 23. David says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Similar sort of language. Speaking of the joy and the provision that God gives, his cup overflows. And we certainly have a cup that overflows. If we have Jesus, we have everything we need and it's, well, and it's so much that we could give it away. So we're reminded immediately in all of this picture language about anointing that we have many blessings that are ours and in Christ we have all. Everything that is ours is to give away. Once we were sinners, shut out of the presence of God, but now, by faith, we are seated at the divine table. I love that song, the first song we sang. Jesus, thank you. Once enemies, now we're sitting around the divine table. As Imagine that, you know, with uh, eating from the king's table. And for a humble, repentant, broken sinner... The second best news to being accepted by God is to be accepted by God's people. What could be better? It's a very humbling and inviting thing. Actually, you might, it might be helpful to understand that one of the blokes that have joined the men's Bible study just in the last 12 months has actually said this very thing to me. The thing that he enjoys most is the, is the, uh, 
the camaraderie, the fellowship, the, the just getting together with blokes. It's not something that is easy to do in this world. It's hard to find. People where you can be accepted, where you get listened to, where you can have clean um, banter and, and just general good friends. I mean, that's a lovely thing. And uh, he, he said that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very important thing to him. So well done to, to, to you when you invite someone to church or to your Bible study. Don't stop inviting. Don't stop it because people are waiting and looking for that kind of inclusion, that belonging. I think Sam Chan again tells me, you know, sometimes people want to belong before they believe. So help them do that. And, uh, and the McCrindle research there just reminds me that, again, people are, are interested in um, spiritual things. They're not altogether shut off from that. But what they want to know is, is this group really true? Are they real? Do they, does the rubber hit the road with these people? Are they living their faith? Does this Jesus character really shine out in these people? Is he fair dinkum? Is, are they fair dinkum? That's what people are looking for. It's tragic when you go to a church and you don't get the welcome. Have you been, been there? I think all of us know. We've been to a church where no one speaks to you and you feel like, well, I'm not welcome here, that's for sure. And that's a terrible indictment on that church. Jesus felt the same way. He went to Simon the Pharisee's house. He had to wait for Mary Magdalene to come in with a, with a bottle of perfume and her tears to anoint him. And Simon the Pharisee, you know, rebukes Mary, oh, wasting all that perfume. He says, well, you didn't anoint me, mate. You could have failed to anoint Jesus, failed to welcome him, failed to love him. Let's go to the third picture. There's a picture of the Jew of Mount Hermon, and there should be a picture of, there it is. So in the background, you can see the mountain range. It's the highest mountain in all of Israel, Mount Hermon. Um, and it's, you can see there's snow up there on the tops of the mountains. So there's a lot of water runs off. It's the headwaters of the Jordan River. So the water that flows down through from north to south through Israel comes from Mount Hermon. And, um, and it, uh, it, it waters all of those valleys that, you know, an Israelite will know when you talk about the dew from Mount Hermon or the water from up there. That's the life blood of the, of the whole of the country. What's, uh, what does he mention it for? He says it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Well, Mount Zion is um, kind of like the Revelation picture of the new church. It's David's prophetic view of the um, gathered people at, at the temple in, in Jerusalem. We, uh, we know that that's not really the actual church of God or the church of the, the new church, but it was their thinking. Mount Zion was, the, was the, the gathered people, the redeemed people together at the, town, the temple mount in Jerusalem. So this was all God's people together. So all the people of God are receiving some blessing. It was falling on them. It was the moisture that was coming down to a dry Mount Zion. Mount Zion was typically a very dry place. Jerusalem wasn't full of water, um, wasn't full of dew, but Mount Hermon was. And so there's, uh, there's this great picture of blessing once again. It's blessing from above, flowing down. And in the same way that water gives life to the desert, unity and harmony among God's people, give life. It's a gift. It gives life to people. We should never underestimate the power of unity or the blessing of a church unified community. I don't say these things, I didn't pick this psalm so that, oh yeah, our church needs to hear about unity. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> um, you generally are a pretty unified bunch now. But what do you think will destroy a church unity quicker than anything else? What will destroy church? What will destroy a church family? What? Any ideas? Gossip. Any other ideas? Well, pretty. 
doubt? Is, was that what you said? Steve, yeah. That will. That'll, that'll certainly kill a church, especially from the leadership. Yeah. But you're right, it's gossip. Um, Tom Rayner, in his little book, I Am a Church Member, has a chapter devoted to church unity. I am a church member who unifies my church, is the topic of the chapter. And uh, more than half of that chapter is devoted to just the way we speak about others in the church. A couple of years ago, we had a speaker at Tamworth Christian Men's Dinner who came from the Bruderhof community up near Inverell. You've probably all heard of them. Uh, they're a bunch of Christians who live together on a farm and there may be, I don't know, there's many of them. Perhaps there's tens or 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 people. I'm not quite sure, but it's quite a lot. And they all live on the one farm and operate as a commune. They raise all their stuff, they grow their food, and they homeschool their children. And people can look at them and go, oh, uh, that's, uh, they're a bit odd, a bit weird. But he spoke about um, how they do life together. And uh, someone said to him, all those people together on a farm like that and all the time, how do you stay sane and how do you stay respectful? And he said, well, we have one rule, just one. There's not to be any talking about anyone else behind their backs. That's it. No other rules. He said, that takes care of nearly everything. Just that. No other rules. You know, the, you'd think, oh, people, a group that size, it'd have to be a whole bunch of things. Just don't gossip. Don't talk about anyone else. So one of the things that we need to be aware of is that point that we just got to be careful about our speech and about how we speak about others. A believer who deeply loves Jesus won't undermine others with gossip. Scripture in Ephesians 4.29 says, uh, only say things that will build others up according to their needs. Only things that build others up. So positive things, encouraging things. There might be times when you need to uh, go to someone with a rebuke or admonition about something that you've seen. Um, and, you know, you do that with the utmost humility and respect. But you never pull them down in other people's eyes. If someone at church begins to gossip about someone, you quietly take them aside and you rebuke them. It'll be good for them and it'll be good for the church. But you do it with gentleness and humility, of course. Another thing that uh, churches who unify do is they, church members forbear with each other. We, we are, we, I get easily irritated, I can tell you. Trish will tell you. you know. and, uh, and honestly, you know, silly little habits can irritate me. But because I know that Jesus has spent his life, given his life, to forgive me for my irritations and my sins, I need to forbear with others. It's just the way we do life together. It gets past, you let things go to the wicket keeper, so they say. You don't make a fuss about silly little things. You put them aside. You let them go. Um, Paul says instead... Do this, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. They're always good things to do, aren't they? They're positive and they're going to increase the spiritual life of the church. A church member who deeply loves Jesus will not seek his own preferences and desires over those of another. You know, it's, um, I'm amazed that we got through this renovation so easily. You know, there wasn't arguments, wasn't too many that I know of, about colours, carpets, chairs. There was a few discussions, but there wasn't any factions. Someone going, well, I'm going this way. Well, let's follow me. You want that, you know, and that would be the quickest way to divide a church. I've been in one where that was red carpet or blue carpet, and there was two factions. Oh, my goodness. It was awful. So we, uh, we don't... We don't favour our preferences over others. Oh, it's not an eternal matter. Let's just let it go. 
A church member who deeply loves Jesus will be devoted to seeking the good of another. Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And it's, uh, the picture is one of like a symphony that works beautifully. All the sounds come together beautifully. The melody is a, is a, is a, is a pleasant sound to the ear. With the church is an organic unity. It is something. It's not an organisation. It's, a, a, it's an organic thing. It's alive. And uh, like a body, each part has its function. And when they all do their functions, it's swimmingly. It's beautiful. But why is, why is church unity, why is this new community such a radical idea? It is a radical new community. Well, we know the answer, don't we? It's, it's because of sin. And... Uh, sin creates disharmony and hostility. I'm, I don't think it's any surprise to any of us that um, um, that the church struggles with um, with unity. There's always a struggle. We are broken. <laughs> We're still being complete. We're not completed. <laughs> the work's in progress. But since the 1960s, our culture has become the benchmark of individualism. We, everywhere in the world now looks at the West and says, we want to be like them because they have individualism. That's about pleasing ourselves. And the world sees that as a good thing. But it's not. It's anti-God. And um, so while the church should be in the world, the world shouldn't be in the church in that respect. So who, but the thing is, the world's very tempting and it's very tempting to be like that. The spirit of the age comes in. It's very easy to say, well, I, I want this or I think that. Well, no, it's about me. It's my choice. The world's a beautiful gift to us, but it's a terrible master. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world any longer. If you used to be like that, and we probably all did at some point, don't do it anymore. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let your mind be like that of Christ. Don't think, Paul is saying, that you can selfishly come into the church and think you can fulfill your dreams or fulfill your goals. Don't bring the uh, consumerism of the world's mindset into the church and think that you can uh, satisfy your choices. This is a very destructive way to think because the moment we do our preferences, our beliefs, our presupp presuppositions, our biases, our gifts, our abilities, our tongues, our experience will be more important than someone else's and unity will just go out the door in a way. And so we have to work extra hard because we are sinners still. It takes supernatural power to overcome sin. How do we do it? Well, we be like Christ. Christ gave us everything we need for this. You know the, uh, the old story of um, the, the old illustration of the hub and the, we the spokes? If Jesus is the hub, we're all like the spokes in the wheel. And if the spokes are closer to, as they come closer to the hub, they're closer to each other. So there's a sense in which the only real answer for us is to be close to Jesus, each one of us. Therein we'll be close to each other and we'll love, our love for each other will we'll show out. Paul says it well in, in a slide of one of these um, quotes in verse Ephesians 4.13, I think there should be a picture of it there somewhere that uh, uh, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. So all of the work of the church is for that end. Until we all reach unity in what? Well, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. That's our goal. There it is. That's the, the goal for you and me. To reach unity, to think alike, a believe alike, agree with each other about how we do our faith and about um, the knowledge of the Son of God. And that will bring us together. There's a final thought 
that I need to say, and it's uh, in that last little phrase, even life evermore. The psalm writer seems to be saying, okay, this unity is something like heaven. <laughs> well, it is actually, and uh, we shouldn't ever think that we're going to be there, this side of heaven. But it is a good point to make. There's a lot of ones in Ephesians 4. There's one Lord, only one Son of God and the Father of all. Um, and there's one faith based upon the person and work of Jesus. There's not a multitude of faiths. We, we have one faith. It's based on what Jesus did. It's based on you know, the, the blood of Christ washing away our sin, the atonement for our sins, and, uh, and the way of salvation is by grace, not through works. These are things that we hang on to with a closed hand. We don't, we don't banter about them and we don't agree to disagree. They're what Christians believe. That's our faith. It's one faith. It's sealed by one spirit. There are no second-class Christians amongst us. We are all one in Christ. And the kicker is this. We're all united by one baptism into one body so that we have the spirit of God to, to um, help us live together. We have the resources we need. Are we, if someone came to this church and uh, you asked them as they left the church, one little question, how much like heaven was church for you today? What do you think they would say? How, how would they score us? Well, it's an interesting question. And what criteria would be used to ask them that? But there's a sense in which that's not far from the truth. We are to be a foretaste of heaven. Our little community of, of, of love here, of faith, ought to be a little foretaste of heaven. So brothers and sisters, when you live together in unity, there the Lord bestows his blessing. I pray, my prayer is that we get better and better at it. We're not too bad at being unified. But let's keep in mind, sin can easily come. One of the things about unity is it takes so long to gain and it can go like that. One thing can take it away. So let's continue to pray and to seek the Lord, to seek closeness to him. And, um, and perhaps God will bless us in, this, uh, in the same way that he says how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have a great plan. It's to bring people who were once far away together and bring them to be more like your son Jesus, conform to his image. We pray you'd continue to work on us to do that. Help us love one another with a, with a love that, uh, um, that never ends. And... Uh, and forgive and bless and, um, and encourage each other for as long as it takes until Jesus returns. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Just a reminder that our Friday morning Bible study group starts um, this week. And also, if you're able to help out uh, with um, providing accommodation for that young lass, that would be terrific too. And please f uh, feel free to stay around. I think food's going to come out our ears over lunch, all right? So we need someone to eat it. So please feel free to stay with us. And we finish up this morning uh, with these words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these.